What's up, gangsters? It is time for a how-to video. Uh, and it's it's been a while since I've done one of these, just purely on technique. I, I've just uh, kind of just haven't felt uh, inspired to, but uh, some conversations uh, in Scale Modeler's critique group and elsewhere lately have led me to think that this might be relevant to your interests. So, this is going to be all about hairspray chipping. I say all about. It's actually going to be a little more narrowly focused than that. This is specifically going to be about literally hairspray chipping, not chipping fluids or, or anything else. And specifically about using this hairspray. This is Tresemme Medium Hold Number 3 ultra fine mist. Now, I understand that there are a bunch of different kinds of hairspray. There's a bunch of different ones from Trace MA. This exact one may or may not be available where you are, but let me explain. The reason that I use this exact one is because what better reason do you need? Mike Rinaldi uses it. If you're not familiar with Mike Rinaldi, you definitely need to look him up. He is not the inventor of the hairspray chipping technique, but he is definitely a master of said technique and it's the one he uses and for me that was a good enough recommendation so that's the first one I bought and it has continued to work well for me so um, I continue to use it um, and I, I've I'm accustomed to it and I, chipping is one of those things where becoming accustomed to your materials is super super important and I'll come back to that in a second but more specifically, I choose to decant my hairspray into a little bottle of Hooray spray like this. Rinaldi sprays it straight from the can. Now, he also is doing, uh, you know, armor for the most part. And I think that spraying from the can works better in that situation. You know, he, he says... Uh, he holds it at arm's length and he sprays and, uh, you know, no matter how many times I try to do it with from the can, I just end up screwing up and getting too much. And one of the variables that really affects how well chipping works is the amount of hairspray you put on. I did a whole long video exhaustively about comparing tools and techniques for chipping. It's somewhere back in my catalog of videos and I talked about all the variables. I'm not going to go into all those, you know, in depth with, with this video. Suffice it to say, I don't feel like I'm good at spraying from the can, so I don't. The other thing is that because I'm mostly doing it on aircraft, I want more controlled location of, of the hairspray because I don't need to chip over the entire thing, and so I don't feel like I need a hairspray over the entire thing. In fact, some people would counsel against that because you may find, and I have a, a little bit to a certain degree, that if you've got hairspray on top of your, your chip layer, aluminum, steel, whatever that is, and then you've got paint on top of the hairspray, and then you start doing masking operations on top of that, that in the places where the hairspray is, you may find yourself popping paint chips off when you pull your masking tape, no matter how careful you are. I, I will talk about that here in a second with the, with the subject that I'm, I'm currently working on. I, ha I did have that a few times, and, you know, it's, it's, it's just a thing you have to be careful of. Um, some people will lay down a clear coat uh, on top of their base layers as a way of helping to protect that, from, to, to keep that from happening. Um, that doesn't really help you with pulling paint off of your chipping layer, though, because it's the hairspray that's weakening things. So, you know, it's just one of those things you just have to be aware of as a possibility and just be prepared for it so that you don't, you know, lose your mind if it happens. Uh, now, the next thing that this is going to be a little more specific to is the kind of paint that I'm using. I think anybody who's watched any of my nonsense much knows that I am a big fan of MRP. And the subject that I'm working on here is all MRP. Um, it is, in fact, 
a Spitfire Mark 9, the Tamiya 132nd Mark 9 to be specific. Um, and so this, you know, the things that I'm going to talk about here really do specifically address uh, working with uh, lacquer, because that's what MRP is. It's a straight up lacquer. So without any further jaw flapping on my part, let's just get to it and let's actually do some chipping. Okay, so here we go. You can see that I've already done some chipping on this thing. In fact, I've pretty much done all that I'm going to do on the left wing. And so I can talk about some of the, I don't know, I guess you could call it philosophical aspects of chipping before I actually get into demonstrating how, how I'm doing it. Um, and again, this may, you know, this may make the hairs on the back of your neck curl up because you're like, what do you mean philosophy? Okay, let me explain. Chipping is one of those things with model making where uh, it is very difficult to get it to look realistic. Uh, I, you know, there's different ways of doing it. There's doing it with a silver pencil, there's painting it on, there's using a sponge, there's hairspray chipping or chipping fluid chipping. And um, to me, to my eye, and you know, this is this, you know, this may just be me, there is nothing more authentic than doing a subtractive uh, type of chipping. And by subtractive, I mean, you're knocking the paint off in the same way that the paint is actually being knocked off in real life. Um, <clears throat> It is just uh, difficult to get the qualities of chipping that I'm about to talk about uh, with uh, some other method, uh, specifically painting on, especially using a pencil to draw them on. Uh, to me, every time I see pencil chipping, I look at it and I go, oh, that was done with a pencil. And as one of my old photography mentors used to say, if the effect uh, is the first thing you notice, you're doing it wrong. Uh, it should be the story. That's what should that's what that's what should be happening in the viewer's mind, not uh, you know guessing which technique that was. So, um, and and this is <laughs> this is going to be a little bit of a counterpoint and I, and a and a kind of a backhanded shout out. If you guys aren't familiar with Martin uh, Kovach, I hope I'm saying that Martin. Anyway, he has got a YouTube channel called Night Shift Modeling, and Martin is a fantastic modeler, a great artist and a really talented video maker. He started doing videos recently, and they're just fantastic. He's funny, he's engaging, and he's really good at explaining technique. But he and I have beef because he likes exclusively to do paint chipping, does not feel that hairspray chipping is, that is as controllable as paint, uh, and doesn't feel like it's any quicker. Now, I will give him that on that last point. It's If you do it right, hairspray chipping is not any quicker, really, than, than paintbrush chipping or sponge chipping. And you'll see why as I kind of go through this. Um, because it all comes down to really controlling the, 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 the variables that I'm about to talk about. Um, so he and I have disagreement there. But look, you can't argue with Martin's results. His work is fantastic. But... Uh, you know, you watch his video, you watch my video, you decide for yourself which technique you feel like is most effective for you. One thing about paintbrush chipping or sponge chipping is that it's not nearly as much about alchemy uh, as, as, as this method is. Um, so, I, what, what, what is this philosophy that I, that I, that I keep uh, mentioning? Alright, I, I define chipping in terms of five variables. Uh, size, location, shape, distribution, and diffusion. Now, what the hell do I mean by all of that? Okay, look, size, shape, and location should be pretty self-explanatory, okay? Size is size. Uh, and as Mike Rinaldi says, there is no such thing as a chip that's too small. I think that a huge part of getting realistic chipping is in getting the really, really small ones. It's easy to knock a big chunk of paint off and have it look realistic, but in most cases you'll find that real life chipping has a variety of sizes of chips. And you can see what I'm talking about there. There's some big hunks of paint that are gone 
and some really little tiny ones. And if you look like in the middle of that panel right there, you can barely see them, but they're there. Those are some super, super, super tiny chips. And this is one place where I feel like, like the, this method of chipping has it all over any others, is that ability to get the really small ones. So that's size. Location, look, location is really important. I, I've talked about this in other videos where what I, what I want to try to do with my chipping is create a sense of chaos within a pattern. And the pattern is reflective of the human activity that caused the chipping in the first place or the weathering phenomenon, whatever it is. And that pattern tells the story if you do it effectively. And so obviously what I'm trying to do here is I've got a small story happening here about dudes tromping all over this area of a Spitfire wing. And this is characteristic of Spitfires. They pretty much all have this. And they have it on the other side as well to a lesser degree, which is what I will uh, be demonstrating on here in a second. Then I've got another little story happening here about dudes removing gun bay covers. Obviously, you're going to get a little bit of, you know, tools dragging and knocking around and things like that that's going to remove paint. You know, then there's some, some stuff, you know, with guys walking along this area. Anyway, point is, that pattern and the location of the chips within that pattern is, is how the story is, that's the basic script for the story, if, if you will. The shape, shape is super important. And again, this is where I feel like that this is a, the superior method. You can paint good shape and you can create good shape with a sponge, but in my mind, it's not as easy to, to get the randomness or the really nice jagged edges uh, at whatever size you're doing. At a certain point, a paintbrush is just gonna produce a small little dot of paint. When what you want is a bunch of really ragged, jagged edges, because that's what chips do. So, that's size, shape, and location. Now, what about diffusion and distribution? Okay, that's a little bit more uh, esoteric. I don't know what the right term is, abstract, whatever you wanna call it. But diffusion is basically just the scatter, okay? So what I'm talking about there is that you've got uh, the, uh, the, the, the big chunks that are removed here where the majority of the wear is taking place. But as the amount of, tra of wear tapers off, when you move outward from this area, you get this diffusion of chips. It's not just boom, there's a chunk of paint missing. It's boom, 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 boom. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. But, you know, when you look at real chipping, you'll see that effect where you get the big thing happening where the most wear is, and then this sort of tapering off effect as you move away from that. And that's how really all of this paint wear starts is with these little tiny chips that as they keep getting hammered on, it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger until you have an area that looks like this. Okay, so that's diffusion. And I think it's super important. And it can be one of the most difficult things to achieve um, with, with, the, with this method. Um, well, really with all of these methods, but, it, but it's a little tougher with the hairspray method because you're kind of using this relatively brute force technique to get the paint off of there. And so then how do you come back and control it in these areas where you want to get that diffusion? That's, that's, uh, that's one of the challenges. All right, now, what about distribution? What does that mean? Okay, one of the most difficult things for the human brain to do is purely random. And you see this when people start trying to brush paint chips because there's this tendency to think that you're being random because you're painting a little bit here and then you're painting a little bit here and then you're painting a little bit here. And then you back up and look at it and you realize that all of your spots where you stop to paint are kind of equally spaced. That's what I'm talking about when I, when I say distribution. What is the sort of, I don't know, pattern or, or scatter or whatever you want to call it of these chips. There are places where they should be relatively uniform, like 
you know, where they follow a line of rivets like these little chips here do. Those obviously are going to be uniformly spaced because the rivets are. But when you have uh, a situation like this, let's take the front of this gun cover, for example. I, I had to do some tuning on this because when I did the first chips, I discovered that I had a patch here and a patch over here. And it just didn't look to me, it just didn't look natural to me because I'm thinking in my mind, this is going to get jacked up all the way along its edge. There's a series of screws here that have to be removed for this thing to come out. That's the first thing that they're going to do. They may put, you know, a screwdriver in there to pry it up if it's a little sticky. Who knows what happens, right? The bottom line is that it's probably not going to be where here, where here, where here, unless there's something there that creates that pattern. Like in this case, what I've tried to do is create wear along each one of these panel line joints because you see that on the real thing. There, and so it's kind of repetitive. Same thing that I was saying about the rivets before. So those are cases where you want some uniformity because again, that helps tell the story. But otherwise, the challenge is to create that distribution that's totally random like I've got here. All right, there is no rhyme or reason to the scatter of these chunks of paint that are lifted off here. And so you, your brain doesn't, doesn't subconsciously short circuit when you look at those and think, oh, that looks kind of like it was laid out because that's what happens. And, and it, just doesn't, it just doesn't appear to be natural. So, all right, now that I've been running my mouth this whole time, let me finally get to actually punching some holes in this paint. And I'm going to try and do some of this on camera. And, uh, you know, hopefully it will be effective. I, 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 I'm, I'm just not good at working on camera. I don't expect this to be any different. But... I'm going to work on it and I'm going to talk about it and hopefully it'll all be okay. So the first thing is a little bit of water, okay? It doesn't take a whole lot. And this is one of the mistakes that I think a lot of people end up making with chipping, especially if you're using any of the normal acrylics or even a hybrid acrylic like Tamiya, is people are using too much water. And so they get these giant chunks of, of paint flying off. And this is one of the things that's, that's unique about, about using lacquer that I think actually makes it a lot better. Um, when the hairspray activates underneath the paint, okay, that's what causes the paint layer to loosen and, and, and pop off there. Um, with acrylics, because they're softer, I guess, more absorbent, I don't know what the deal is with them, but... They absorb more water, they're weaker paints, they come flying off in bigger, less controllable chunks. And so you have to be super, super careful with the amount of water that you use if you're, if you're chipping with, with, with acrylics. People kind of have this idea that you can't chip with lacquers uh, or that it's, that it's just super hard. Now, the second part, there's some truth to. Chipping with lacquers is quite a bit more difficult than chipping with acrylics for, for the reasons that I just talked about. Um, it, but also, lacquers are just by, I mean, not only are lacquers just by nature a, a more durable layer of paint, but you can see with this, uh, with this MRP, you know, it's got a little bit of a, of a sheen to it. It's got a, a kind of a nice natural gloss. And so it, it tends to want to shed the water. And so it's not as important with this stuff uh, how much water you use up to a certain point. In the beginning, it doesn't matter. I mean, I've literally put pieces in a container of water and let them sit there for a minute when I wanted to really rip a lot of paint off and I was using, and I was using MRP. Um, but point being is that... Uh, uh, it's just not the same as if you're chipping with acrylics. Okay, now, back to that thing about it being hard to get started, okay? This is a relatively stiff brush. This is called a Deerfoot Stippler. 
and it's a great brush for doing chipping effects. Um, it's it's like I said, it's pretty stiff, um, and so it works works good for this. But I could sit here and do this just about all day, and nothing would happen. And if you are watching videos on YouTube where guys are chipping, you know, one of the vinyl acrylics like AK or Vallejo or even Tamiya, they're using these soft paint brushes and they're being real delicate and they're getting all these great chips. If that's what you're expecting to happen and you're using lacquers, you're going to be frustrated because it's just not going to. Um, even if you get real aggressive with it, okay, and start banging on it, chances are nothing is going to happen. And so dudes get frustrated, they give up, whatever. Um, and that's understandable, but you just ha you have to know the material and you have to be patient. And it helps to know uh, some tricks, okay? And one of the tricks, and I should have I should have mentioned this before, but I do a lot of my paint wear with sandpaper. It's one of my favorite things, and like you can see. Um, like right here on this round L, I've got some, some white showing. And I know some people are going to freak out about that. I've got some reference photos that lead me to believe that these were base coated in white before they painted them. And plus, I like the way that looks. It gives it a little bit of a faded appearance. So you can see some of the white showing through. That's just purely sanding it a little bit with really, really fine sandpaper. Now, Sandpaper is also good not only to start creating the abrasion effects that you might want, because look, the paint gets abraded before it gets chipped. So in some cases, it's a good idea to do some of that abrasion first. And so like right here, I've got this little piece of Infini sanding sponge uh, on this uh, gripped in these gripper tweezers. And I had already used the, this, and I forgot to say that to do a little bit of abrasion along here. And the reason that I that I wanted to bring that up is not just because uh, it uh, is important to the look and the process, but because it will help you get the chipping started because I'm creating some little bitty defects in the paint and that will help the water get under there. And that obviously is what helps the chipping get going. So a little bit of that will help you out. Now, uh, uh, you can see that I got some chipping going there along the edge. Okay, you can see right there, there's some started to happen because I had, I had done that sanding. So, um, but if I hadn't been, I could have been pounding on it all afternoon the way I was doing it and, and nothing would have happened. So what do you do? Well, there's what I just said about introducing some defects with sandpaper, but then there's also just getting a more harsh tool. Okay, this is a fiberglass pencil. Specifically, this is called a scratch brush. And there are two different kinds of these. This one is relatively soft. You can see the bristles are relatively bendy. People talk about fiberglass pencils as being good for uh, removing ejector pin marks and things. Okay, that is a different kind, all right? This skinny tipped one is the one that's good for that. It has much thicker and stiffer bristles and you really don't want to use this one for paint wear because it'll strip the paint right down to the plastic in a heartbeat. So don't get them confused, okay? Uh, this one will remove plastic. This other one doesn't remove much of anything except it's great for chipping lacquer, all right? So what I do is I get that thing in the water and I'm going to try and demonstrate this effectively here. It's going to be a little bit difficult to get everything on camera and to be able to see what I'm doing because I'm not going to screw this thing up just to show you guys what's going on. 
All right, so make sure I'm still on camera. I'm gonna start using this tapping motion. And part of what I'm trying to keep in mind in the back of my head while I'm doing this is that what's characteristic of Spitfires is that it has the same sort of wear pattern on the starboard wing, but not as, as heavily as it is on the left side. So I'm trying to kind of sneak up on it, but I want, I want to create some of these little tiny chips and I guess because the, the glass bristles in this brush are, are stiff enough, they will kind of poke through the paint maybe, I, maybe that's what's going on, I don't know. And they will create little tiny pits and, and, and uh, holes that the water can start to seep through and begin the chipping process and you can see them all right those are those are those are looking good okay see i'm getting some really really tiny ones there those are nice now this is another thing with chipping no matter what your paint you're working in once you start to see some action happening, stop, okay? Stop, take a look at what's going on, size things up and decide what to do next. And this is especially important if you're chipping uh, the acrylic stuff because the next poke at it that you take could be the one that takes you too far. Uh, because, again, with the acrylics, you get a big chunk of paint flying off of there and all of a sudden things don't look right. And even with this, now that I've got some seepage of the water underneath the paint going on, now this whole area is going to be sort of, you know, loose. And I just don't want to go too far. So one thing that I'll do sometimes is just grab my airbrush, blow some air on there, dry things off. It doesn't take a whole lot of drying to slow the process down. But once I've done that, now I can stop, take a look. And I'm looking at this all through my Optivisor, by the way. I, I do, this is one of the things that I definitely, definitely recommend having proper magnification for. So I'm, I'm taking a look at that and uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm cool with the way things are starting out, but again, I don't want it to get out of hand. So I'm uh, now I'm going to switch over to a small Deerfoot stippler and Just do a little bit more, and, and you can see where those little bitty ones that I started immediately start to open up because that area is, is loose now. So got to be careful because if you want to preserve the little bitty chips, you just, you, you can't get too aggressive. And so you can see that even though this is lacquer, and it is tougher, that it, it actually starts happening pretty easily once the water is under there. That's just kind of the key, is you just have to, you just have to get things started. And you can see me again using this kind of, of tapping motion. Sorry, it's probably not showing up on camera very well. Using that tapping motion to get things going and make the little, little tiny chips. So I think that's about all that I'm gonna try and demonstrate on camera because now I'm starting to get into where 
um, it, 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 I, I, re I just really need to be careful because, I mean, look, worst case is if, if, if I screw this up, I'll just, uh, shoot a little bit of hairspray on it, shoot some, some color back on top of it and, and redo it. Um, it's, it's not, you know, it's not a disaster if it doesn't work perfectly, but I don't want to have to do that. I don't like going backwards. And so I'm going to just chill on that area. Now, this looks pretty gnarly, but it's a great chipping tool. And especially for kind of creating uh, randomness, because again, you're not controlling where it's happening. So it may seem a little scary because it's big and it's, you know, kind of kind of brute force. But it really works pretty good with these with these lacquers. And you'll start to see what I mean here in a second. I'm getting I'm not going to do a whole lot with this cuz I just don't want it to get out of hand, but you can see see starting to get some nice effects going right there where that walkway line is. So, again, that's time to just chill probably dry that off at a minimum I'm gonna to move to a different area come over here get some some scratches going on and 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 again you you, you know it's important to pay attention to what's happening so that you get a uniform distribution Uh, now, I know that what I just said might be confusing because I was talking earlier about a random distribution. And, and uh, yeah, it, can get, it gets weird. But what I mean is you need, a, you need a, a distribution within the pattern that makes sense. Because obviously there's people walking all over this. So I don't want to have where here and here and here. And it's already kind of getting splotchy for me where I don't like feel totally cool about it. So this is when I'm getting into the area where I'm going to want to stop and, and do some, some fine tuning. So I'm going to leave that area alone and I'm going to move over to a really important area and that is the leading edge of, of the wing right here. So I'm going to go back to the fiberglass thing and you can hear I'm just tapping on it. You can see I'm not being gentle. Honestly, chipping is for me anyway is is tiring cuz it you got to get close in and 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 it's sort of constant motion for a while and it's intense but for me the results are, are are really well worth it and I'm starting to get some going right there on the front most portion of the leading edge but I need more on top so I'm kind of shifting my focus up here and just kind of trying to move around I'm, 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 I'm I kind of know in my head and I'm sorry I know I keep banging into the camera I kind of know in my head where I want the most wear to be so you can see I'm, I'm getting some started but it's not easy I mean it's you know, even even knowing how it works, sometimes I'm like, seriously, can we get going already? But it will eventually start to break through the paint. You'll start to get some water in there, and you'll see some results. So you just have to be patient and diligent. So what I'm going to do now, I think, is go off camera and finish this up and then come back and, and take a look at it in a few minutes. Okay, so I went away and pecked at that some more. And uh, it is now time for one of the most important steps in the chipping process. 
and that is the stopping and walking away step. This is one thing I can't emphasize enough that I feel is really important because this is one of those things where it's so intense and you get in so close, it's really easy to get this kind of, of tunnel vision or myopia, whatever you want to call it, where you sort of lose sight of the whole picture because what you're doing is cool and fun. Next thing you know, you've done too much. So it's important to remember the overall look that you're after. I think this pattern is, is pretty good. You know, these airplanes, that this is the pattern that they had where there was more activity uh, on the wing uh, on the, the left side than there was on the right side. Um, and I wanted to reflect that. There was also tend to be also tended to be more activity up here because this is where you put gas in the thing. This is where you take the engine covers off. So there's more activity up here, but it almost got a little bit out of hand right here. So this is the this is the part where I uh, almost as a rule um, I, I assume every chipping session is going to be uh, there's going to be at least two sessions maybe three because I'm going to come back and I'm going to fine tune this stuff. I'm going to make some additions. I may even decide after thinking about it for a while that I just don't like it at all, and I'll come back and I'll put some paint on that and uh, and, and redo some of it. I, I feel like I'm okay with this right now, but I may come back two or three hours from now or tomorrow morning and, and not feel the same way and, and want to modify it. And I have found almost invariably that that always results in some improvement. So... Don't hesitate to take that time and, and come back and look at it again. Now, one question that, that I think people are going to ask is, yeah, but doesn't the chipping get more difficult if you wait too long? Well, yes and no. What you don't know about any of this paintwork is that nothing that I was chipping on on camera here is less than, uh, I think, three days old. And again, this is lacquer. Uh, I, have, I have chipped lacquer as much as a week or two after the fact. Um, I even had a situation last year with uh, a Phantom that I built where I had done a bunch of chipping, done a bunch of oil work, even put a, a layer of dull coat on top of it all and just was sitting here one day looking at it and thinking, you know what, there's some places there that need to be tuned up. And after two or three weeks of drying time of all of that, and really I say drying time is really not accurate because Lacquers are pretty much as dry as they're going to be uh, within about an hour and definitely within 24 hours. But even after all that time had passed, I was still able to do the chipping that I wanted to do uh, on that situation. Was it harder? Yes. Is the chipping a little bit different? Yes. What I find with MRP in particular is that for that first 30 minutes, and I try normally to do my chipping within that first half an hour, kind of my rule is, um, I, I lay down the, 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 the hairspray, I lay down the color coat, and I start chipping as soon as I've got the airbrush clean from the color coat. But with this situation, that just wasn't possible because I had multiple camouflage colors, I had a lot of things going on, there just wasn't going to be any way that I was going get to get to it that quickly, so I had to accept that sacrifice. And what I find is that within that first half an hour or so, that the paint is a little more flexible and it does chip a little easier and a little differently than it does the next day or two, three, four days, however many days it is later. But bottom line is, you can do it. Um, it, it absolutely will still chip. Um, but you can see that you just kind of have to get after it. And, uh, you know, if it seems like it's not going to, uh, you know, start easily. You just kind of have to keep working at it and uh, it will eventually get there for you. So hopefully I've addressed um, everything and hopefully I've, I've, I've answered, you know, some of the questions that uh, some of you guys may have about, uh, about doing this. Okay, it's a few days later and I know this video has been long, but I thought I should close the loop uh, by showing you guys where this thing has ended up uh, after what I feel like is uh, hopefully uh, uh, like 95% of the chipping. I, I have to allow for that 5% because what happens is that I sit here looking at it while I'm doing other things and I see something that irritates me and I have to go and, and, and tinker with it and 
Sometimes that's a good idea. Most of the time it's a good idea. Sometimes it's a bad idea. Uh, but uh, I, I have been doing that. I've been tinkering and tuning and working on other areas, and I think I'm, 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 I'm pretty close to there. Um, so you can see that I finished chipping around this gun bay, and I'm not completely happy with that, but the truth is it's going to get covered up with invasion stripes to about right here, so not, not too big of a deal. Um, as you can see, I've been tuning up this area right here, and still not 100% happy with it, but, but I, I like it better. You may have noticed, well, you wouldn't have noticed, I, I don't think, because I didn't, I didn't finish it during the video clip before, but, but in here and in this area over here, I had um, quite a few of these chips had a kind of a round shape to them. And that is something that I find that happens when you when I chip with with lacquer after that first day uh, is it, it, it I don't know why it is but the way it breaks off it tends to make those sort of rounder shapes and um, I had posted this in a couple of places and a couple of people called me out on that on on the shape of some of those chips just looking too big and too round. And I do take that stuff into account. I may not always do anything with that sort of feedback, but I do always at least consider it. And in this case, those guys were right. And I went back and I just very carefully worked. You can see I worked on the edges there and, and made them more jagged. And I think that's better. And these are subtle little things, but they all add up and people do notice. I also have been working with sandpaper some like here to kind of fade that chipping in right there and make some of those areas more jagged. So I feel like that the tuning up that I've done in this area has, has been pretty good. And you can see that I've been working on some stuff. I'm, I'm pretty happy with uh, what I've got going on around the fuel filler cap there. I got some on the edge of the windscreen where the guy, where the pilot grabs it. I've done some on the, uh, the uh, cowling. Um, and uh, I think that's, that's really about it. I'm not 100% happy with what I've done here on the nose. Um, I'll pick it up here so you can see better. Um, it's a big model. Uh, anyway, you can kind of see, yeah, maybe, if I get it right, get, get, my, get my act together here. Anyway, uh, it's, it's going to be upside down. You can kind of see in there where I've tried to work around the Zeus fasteners and things that are, uh, uh, you know, on the removable parts. You can see underneath here, <laughs> that right there, you can see a big chunk that came off as a result of the paint lifting off of the hairspray when I removed the masking tape. And I honestly may leave it. I kind of like it. Uh, we'll see. That's one of those things where I just have to think about it for a little while. I don't know. Um, but... I'm not super happy with with that right there, with the shape of that on the nose. Uh, may leave it, may not, I don't know. Um, and then uh, you can see over here on the other side, more of the same. Um, if you're super sharp-eyed, you may notice that over here by this roundel, that before I had a chip, I had a couple of, of, of chips right there. And I decided I didn't like the one, and so I just airbrushed over it. And I feel like it was, now it looks good. Whereas before it was it was sketchy. Um, so, you know, they're, they're pretty easy to fix. It's not that big of a deal if you make one that you don't like, or if you end up with an accidental one that you don't want to take advantage of. So, at any rate, there it is, for now. Okay, hopefully that was uh, effective. <laughs> I'm sure that it was neither as short or as funny uh, or as cool or as well produced as uh, Martin's videos about brush chipping, but hopefully this will give you uh, another, you know, another look at, at it from a different point of view and using a different technique. I also uh, really don't want to end the video without emphasizing that, um, you know, as I alluded to uh, earlier, 
there's a lot more alchemy with this method of chipping than with you know any of the of the additive methods brush painting sponge painting pencils whatever this is black magic and I know that I struggled with this process for a long time before I felt like it started to click for me and um, I know that it can be frustrating for for a lot of model makers who are trying to figure it out but practice is the key experimenting on paint mules is really important um, because here's the thing that you've got to figure okay I can say I can tell you in very precise terms exactly how I'm doing it I'm spraying exactly two layers of hairspray and I look for it to have a nice eggshell sheen and I spray my color coat in just a certain way thinned you know in just a particular manner and my camera's about to die my battery is dead uh, hold on a second here uh, I can tell you all those things in very precise terms and you still will not be able to duplicate it because what it comes down to is what is my definition of an eggshell sheen for example what does that mean to me I mean I can tell you <laughs> different guys have a different definition of uh, you know what is glossy and what is satin and you know uh, whatever so um, that's almost kind of meaningless in my opinion yeah that's what I try to do and it's what I try to look for but it's also true that like when you are spraying hairspray on top of uh, silver paint like I was here for the aluminum you're gonna have a very difficult time seeing what the level of sheen is and so you know it's just again th that sort of precise ex explanation is not going to be that helpful but that is what I try to do a couple of layers of hairspray a nice eggshell sheen but if you if you take into account the variability of how you spray on the hairspray and the variability of how you spray your paint itself because you know some guys spray real thin light translucent coats some guys spray full density thicker coats I sort of believe that I'm somewhere in between, but that's really, I mean, I'm only comparing myself to myself. <laughs> I have no idea. Some people might think that my layers of paint are super thin. Matt, you know, Matt McDougall thinks I'm a barbarian that I spray super thick. His chipping goes a little easier because he sprays super, super light. So you've got the variability in, in how much you uh, hairspray you lay down, uh, how much paint you lay down, what kind of paint you're using the timing, all of those variables are going to come into play when you get right down to actually knocking those little pieces of paint off of there. And I get that that can be intimidating. I get that that can be frustrating. But it is what it is. That, that's, I mean, look, if, if you want world-class results, and I'm not saying that this is a world-class result, but if you want world-class results, you're going to have to put in world-class effort. And for me, that's what this, that's what this is all about. You just have to do the work to figure out the process and establish what your personal alchemy is. And once you've done that and it clicks for you, then I think you'll find that this is uh, not only a very realistic way of producing paintware, but it's, it's just a lot of fun. I mean, I that's why I call that hooray spray, because <laughs> it just makes me want to say, uh, you know, happy things. Uh, with my mouth when uh, I see the results. So at any rate, uh, I know this video was long, longer than I wanted it to be, but hopefully it was helpful. At any rate, uh, I always say that at any rate, like a bunch of times, at any rate, anyhow, I appreciate you watching. Much love.